During my residency at Mayo Clinic, we had staff, resident, fellow, medical student, and even a medical aide sometimes in the room to help out with ultrasound procedures. Then I entered the real world, and I was all by myself. The issue of sterility is a personal one that you must all make. I know I've worked with some staff who would just use some rubbing alcohol and clean gloves and inject a knee, while I had other staff who would do three iodine scrubs, surgical drapes, masks, sterile gloves, all to do the same blind knee injection. Now with ultrasound, you add that risk of the probe to the equation. I'm sure you can imagine if you just finished a diagnostic study on someone's plantar fascia, and then the next patient you see is a hip joint injection, there's probably a risk there of cross-contamination of that previous patient's foot to the new patient's hip. So, it is possible to do ultrasound-guided procedures sterily if you're a solo if you follow the following steps. Whether you're sterile or not, I always recommend starting your procedure with a non-sterile scan to identify your target, plan the procedure, and optimize the image. I make sure the equipment is in good location and the patient and I are comfortable. Decide which hand you're going to be using for the probe and which hand you're going to inject with. You can then label the image and save a pre-procedure image, then relabel it for the injection image and save later. I then will mark the skin so that I know exactly where to place the probe later on after the skin is cleaned and I'm sterile. That way it's easy to obtain your target image the second time. You can then clean the patient's skin with iodine or chlorhexidine, clean the gel off of the probe, and what I do is I place a tagoderm strip onto the probe. You then open your sterile gloves and drop your syringes, needles, and squeeze some sterile gel into the sterile glove paper. You wash your hands and put on your sterile gloves and assemble your needles and syringes. Then you must remember which hand is going to be using the probe, and that's going to be your non-sterile hand from this point forward. You use your probe hand to grab the vials of medicines, and the other hand, which will be controlling the syringes, remains sterile. Using the sterile needle hand, you want to rub out any air bubbles that might be underneath the tegaderm. Any air bubbles will block the ultrasound image and cause very poor image quality during your procedure, so it's an important step to remember. Then dip the probe in the sterile gel and place the probe on the patient. I like to perform an ultrasound guided local anesthetic injection for several reasons. First, it allows you twice as much experience. If you guide the local needle and then later the cortisone also, it becomes two for one and you'll increase your learning curve. It's also helpful to make sure the patient is anesthetized, so if you're struggling during the procedure, at least, at least you can be certain that the patient is not suffering too. It provides you a practice run for the cortisone and you can learn the correct trajectory to take and you might also find out that the target is actually not going to be reached by a one and a half inch needle and you can switch to a two inch needle if needed. After the patient is successfully anesthetized, then you can perform the ultrasound guided procedure and save the image of the needle in the target tissue. You can do this quickly and easily by hitting the freeze button once you've pulled the needle out of the patient. You can then go back 5 or 10 seconds to the images prior to you hitting the freeze button and save any, any image you like or you can save the whole video clip if you want to. Now that is an exhausting 10 steps to do and having an extra set of hands can make a world of difference and really speed things up for your clinic. If you have a well-trained assistant, they can enter the patient's information and operate the machine while you're sterile. They can clean the patient, clean the probe, and even apply the tegaderm while you draw up your medications. They can drop additional supplies that you might need onto the sterile field and they can also clean up the patient place a band-aid on them, and give any post-injection instructions once you're done. They also will allow a sterile condom catheter to become possible. There are sterile ultrasound kits <clears throat> that contain a sterile condom cover, sterile rubber bands, sterile gel, but you will need someone else to help place these on the probe. Unlike the tegaderm, which sticks to the probe, it's important to remember that you have to place 
non-sterile gel on the inside of the, the condom cover and then sterile gel on the outside. You can't have any air or gaps between the condom cover and the probe because that will distort and block your image. So you need gel both on the inside as well as the outside of the condom cover. Whereas with Tegaderm, since it applies directly and sticks to the surface of the probe, you don't need any gel on the inside, just on the outside. Here is a sample of an ultrasound guided procedure note that I borrowed from my training at Mayo Clinic. I particularly like the few sentences in the procedure details that discusses why ultrasound was required instead of using a blind injection. I'm sure in the future insurance companies may start asking you why you didn't do a blind injection and it, it's helpful to have some reasons or a statement like this could help justify your ultrasound guidance. Whether they listen to it or not, I don't know. But I think if you have a patient who's morbidly obese, which limits your ability to palpate any bony landmarks, if their INR is therapeutic, somewhere between 2 and 3, uh, if they failed prior blind injections, those are certainly reasons that would justify ultrasound guidance, as well as the, the reasons that are described in the sample note given. Now we're going to quickly go over and review the 10 most common injections that I do and hope this helps you cover your patient population too. We will discuss the four injections of the shoulder, the glenohumeral joint, subacromial bursa, AC joint, and biceps tendon. Also go over tennis elbow, carpal tunnel, CMC, hip joint, greater trochanter, and the knee joint. I prefer to do all my injections with the patient lying down if possible. You don't always know who will get faint on you and it's hard to decide whether to drop your needle or your expensive probe when you try to catch a patient that's starting to fall on you. So for the shoulder, I typically have them side lying with the symptomatic shoulder up. The probe is placed just below the spine of the scapula and is usually you have to move it, slide it slightly medial or lateral to get the target image you want and also tip the probe inferior or superior to get the image you wish and the details you desire. The needle moves from lateral to medial into the posterior joint capsule and this usually requires at least a two inch needle but I've had I've been able to get to it with a one and a half in very thin patients but I've also had to use a three and a half inch needle a spinal needle in larger patients. It's also very important to let the patient know that Typically, right when you enter the joint capsule, there's a sharp pinch of pain that uh, is difficult to uh, avoid, even with anesthesia. So here's the ideal image that you have prior to your injection. What we see here is the superficial skin, the posterior deltoid muscle here. Below that is going to be the infraspinatus tendon, which is running across this, the humerus and attaching over here and we see the hyperechoic line of the humeral head down here we see the bony glenoid and here we see a triangular shaped hyperechoic posterior labrum so your target is going to be between the humerus and the labrum and you're in the joint now this is a relatively small target and if there's a large effusion it can certainly be easier to hit an effusion will typically spill out in this area and distend the joint capsule in the posterior and is easy to target compared to a, a shoulder that doesn't have an effusion. Here is a video clip example of a glenohumeral joint injection. In this example, the needle is already in place and as you can see, as I inject fluid, the posterior joint recess expands slowly and at the end of the procedure, the needle is withdrawn. For the subacromial bursa injection, I have the patient laying on their side with the symptomatic shoulder up. You place the probe on the lateral side of the acromion, just off the edge. The needle is going to go on a long axis route from lateral inferior to medial superior. Sometimes it can be difficult to identify the bursal plane on the ultrasound if there's not any fluid noted. Clinically, they can have very suspicious an obvious subacromial bursitis or impingement, but sometimes you don't see any fluid on the ultrasound. I would still proceed with the injection if you think clinically that's where their pain is coming from.
If there's no fluid, what you can do is have them move or abduct their shoulder slightly and you'll see the rotator cuff moving and the deltoid will not move and that will identify the tissue plane that you're targeting. Also, when you're doing your local anesthetic injection, if the needle's in the right place, you'll see the bursa open up or unzip, almost like a zipper unzipping on a jacket. If you're too superficial, you'll notice the local anesthetic will only be in the muscle, and if you're too deep, you'll feel resistance, and that means you're in the tendon. Here you can see the needle passing through the skin, down through the lateral deltoid, and aiming for this small window of tissue here, which is a small hypoechoic line representing some mild bursal fluid. In my experience, the presence of bursal fluid on ultrasound does not accurately correlate with the clinical suspicion of bursitis, as well as the outcomes of injections. I've done injections with people who have collapsed bursas and their symptoms resolve with the injection, so bursal fluid is not necessarily always present in clinically suspicious bursitis. The AC joint injection is done with the patient lying supine. The probe is placed right over the AC joint with the acromion and the clavicle uh, in view on the screen. The needle is a short axis approach and you use your walk down technique. You want to go for the anterior AC joint since it's larger than the posterior AC joint. It can also be done in a long axis of course as we talked about with the gel standoff and the image on the right shows this technique as described earlier. Here is the ultrasound image example of the AC joint done in a short axis technique. You would adjust your trajectory until you see your needle tip somewhere between B and C and you're probably inside the AC joint and ready to be injected. Here is the ultrasound image example for doing the AC joint injection in a long axis or in-plane approach utilizing the gel standoff technique described earlier. Sometimes this approach can be difficult because of osteophytes and degenerative changes of the joint, but sometimes I like to use it when the clavicle or the acromion is much more prominent than the other bone, making it much easier to target the joint from the right or the left. Injections under the biceps tendon sheath require the patient to lay supine and the probe is placed transverse over the biceps tendon in the bicepital groove. The needle will traverse from lateral to medial and you'll aim to put the tip on the medial side of the groove just under the tendon sheath. If present, the ascending branch of the anterior humeral circumflex artery is usually located lateral to the tendon. It can also be helpful to redirect your needle to the other side after injecting half the solution and this will hopefully free up the tendon from any adhesions that might be present. This technique is usually referred to as hydrolysis. Here is the diagram of the target image and the approach for this procedure. The lateral epicondyle is a very superficial and easy injection to perform. You place the patient's arm in a slightly supinated flexed elbow position, usually with the hand resting on the abdomen. The probe is placed over the lateral epicondyle, long axis to the common extensor tendons, and the needle travels from distal to proximal in a long axis approach. Your target is just above the tendons. Of course, if you're performing a percutaneous tenotomy, your target area is going to be the tendinopathy. Here's an example of how this might look. Since you have such a long ways to travel from skin entry to the point of the injection, you can see it's a very superficial injection going all the way over to here. It is reasonable, once you feel comfortable, to move the target closer to the side of the needle where it's coming from, and that will allow you to have less distance to travel. So, for instance, if you move the image so that the target is here, you would only have to inject this far with the needle instead of going all the way across the screen.